of May 1539. Today, the week-long journey from our staging base in Cuba has ended alongside a large bay in La Florida. After years of planning, our expedition has finally arrived. And so, from a natural harbor thought to be near Tampa Bay, began the first major European expedition of what is now the United States. Spain had first claimed the area only 47 years earlier when Christopher Columbus landed in the Caribbean. Small expeditions had been attempted by Ponce de Leon and Pamphilo de Narvaez, but both met with failure. Now, Hernando de Soto would lead an expedition of almost 700 men, two women, 240 horses, a pack of war dogs, hundreds of pigs, and tons of supplies deep into the interior of this new land. The Spanish Empire was growing. After 700 years of Muslim control, the Spaniards expelled the Muslim Moors and Iberian Jews, and the Spanish Christians regained control of the region. King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile united the warring kingships into the country we now call Spain. Free of the Moors, Ferdinand and Isabella looked to expand the boundaries of the new Spanish kingdom beyond any empire in history. Once Columbus brought back word of a new world across the sea, Spanish explorers and restless conquistadores sailed eagerly across the Atlantic in search of fame and fortune, all sanctioned by Spain to fuel their growing empire with new colonies, gold, and converts to Christianity. America's wealth of treasure became the initial focus of attention, with expeditions led by Hernán Cortés against the Aztecs of Mexico in 1519, and Francisco Pizarro against the Incas of Peru in 1533. One of those who assisted Pizarro was a young, aggressive explorer named Hernando de Soto. After 20 years in Central and South America, de Soto returned to Europe a rich man, having plundered his share of Inca gold and silver. But he soon grew bored with his life of luxury and longed for the adventure of another expedition. He decided to take a major gamble, to spend all of his money to finance another trip to the New World in search of even bigger treasure, and the powerful title of royal governor of the lands he explored and conquered. But this time he would search in the southeastern wilderness of North America, in the name of Ferdinand and Isabella's successor, King Charles V. It did not take long for us to see that this new land would not make our journey easy. Mangroves and swamps were around every turn. But we forged on. The Soto knows what motivates this army, gold. And he is sure it waits for us deep in the interior of this new world. Our encounters with the local Indians came swiftly. They used the tropical woodlands to their advantage. They were like ghosts, first there and then gone again. But we were on alert, and once we engaged them in a skirmish, they were quickly overwhelmed by our weapons and brute force. But in one of the first encounters, we were taken completely by surprise. Not by an ambush, but by what we heard during the fight. As it turns out, one of the first Indians captured was actually Juan Ortiz, a survivor of a small, ill-fated attempt at colonization and conquest 11 years earlier under the command of Narvaez. Ortiz had been captured and tortured by the Indians, but eventually he learned to live with the local people. De Soto's spirits were raised. He had found an interpreter. Ortiz's experience with the native people opened his eyes to a different way of life. In the south were the coastal settlements of the Calusa, consisting of thatched buildings and complex maritime societies. To the north lay great chiefdoms like the Apalachee, Kofitacheki, and Kusa, who lived in large, permanent settlements and relied on extensive agriculture, hunting, and fishing. 
they had well-organized communities with a strong system of social ranking. The most outstanding features of these cultures were great mounds that served as temple bases and burial sites. Many of these chiefdoms extended for hundreds of miles and consisted of many cultures and languages. During his time with the Indians, Ortiz had heard about a powerful kingdom to the north where warriors were said to wear helmets of gold. De Soto sent out a scouting party. They returned with a message that the gold could be found at a place called Cali. We left Pedro Calderon with our ships and 100 soldiers in reserve in the settlement we called Usita after the local chief. Our other goals of founding colonies and harbors in the New World for our great king, Charles V, were dashed from De Soto's mind. His obsession was treasure. So on we marched. The captured Indians were forced into service as porters and guides. It helped the Spaniards move faster, but was torturous for the Indians and displaced them deep into areas inhabited by other tribes. As they reached Cale, near present-day Ocala, they once again heard familiar information. No gold or supplies here, just a little further on. The Indians were wise to the Europeans' violent determination to find this gold they so cherished. They had already had similar encounters with Ponce de Leon and Narvaez on their short expeditions. The surest way to rid their tribe of this menace was to talk of gold farther on. The tactic worked, and on they marched towards present-day Gainesville. But De Soto had tactics of his own. His strategy as he met with each new tribe was to take hostages and release them only after the chief agreed to lead his expedition to the territory of the next tribe. Brutal battles were often the result. Near present-day Live Oak, Florida, 400 Indian warriors prepared a surprise attack. But their bows and arrows were no match for the crossbows, gunpowder, horses, and steel blades of the Spaniards. All were killed or captured. The treatment was harsh for the captives, and those who created trouble were dealt with swiftly. Some lost hands, or their nose, or were torn to pieces by the war dogs. The brutality of the Spanish Inquisition had found its way across the sea. Yet there was cruelty on both sides, for similar fates awaited Spanish soldiers captured by Indians. As the expedition's first winter came, the group settled in a fruitful area near present-day Tallahassee. They evicted the local Apalachee community and took over their village. In retaliation, the Apalachee burned their village to the ground rather than see it remain in control of the Spaniards. The ruins provided little shelter during the cold winter. Almost all the captive Indians died of exposure. But the region had abundant food, and DeSoto decided to use the area as his new base of operations. He sent a small band of soldiers back to Usita to bring up Calderon's 100 men and his ships. Throughout the winter, the Apalachee warriors continued to attack with their longbows. The skill of these archers won a newfound respect from DeSoto's army, but it did not deter them from their quest. As the winter wore on, our translator, Juan Ortiz, learned from one of the captives that a rich land called Cofita Chequi lay to the northeast. Gold. That is what drives this army onward, yet it is always just beyond our reach. In March of 1540, DeSoto and his regrouped army headed northeast through present-day Georgia and South Carolina, this time with very few Indian porters. To DeSoto's surprise, the chief of Kofita Cheke turned out to be a woman. She wore a cape of feathers and pearls, which she offered to the Spaniards as a gift. DeSoto's men were so taken by the land, the people, the wide rivers in the area, and their minor treasure trove of pearls, they wanted to stay and establish a colony. But DeSoto refused. He was still driven by his quest for gold. Exploiting the friendship of the chief, he forced her and her people into service as guides and porters, this time heading west into present-day North Carolina. They crossed the Appalachian Mountains on trails that had never before seen horses or pigs or war dogs. 
As usual, there was no gold, and they were left stranded when the female chief escaped. Hoping to beat his ships coming north from Havana with supplies and reinforcements, DeSoto decided to head south toward the Gulf. After passing through the vast chiefdom of Cusa, they entered the territory of Tascalusa, a native leader more imposing than any DeSoto had previously encountered. Tascalusa put on a friendly appearance and offered the Spaniards the quarters they demanded, while at the same time sending word downriver to prepare an ambush. The expedition progressed southward to the stockaded village of Mabila, the namesake of Mobile, Alabama. At Mabila, we were invited inside the Palisades. There, we were ambushed by Tuscaloosa's allies. But our army rallied, and we quickly overthrew the village, burning it to the ground. It was the largest battle we have encountered to date. More than 40 persons were killed, 22 of our men were dead, and more than 150 wounded, including the soldier himself. Indian casualties were much higher, probably as many as 2,500 dead. But much of our food and supplies, along with our meager treasure of pearls, have been destroyed in the fires. The Battle of Mabila was the turning point of the expedition. De Soto now had a major dilemma on his hands. Ortiz, the interpreter, told De Soto of Indian reports of ships in the bay just a few days south of their location. De Soto knew they carried much needed supplies and reinforcements. However, he also knew that after the torturous journey his men had endured for the past year and a half, chances were good that once they spotted the ships for themselves, they would refuse to go on. De Soto had a lot at stake. He had invested his entire fortune in this expedition, and his only hope was to find his cache of gold. He also knew that if his army failed, he would never command another. In a desperate attempt to salvage something from the expedition, he decided to push his tired and rebellious men northward, away from the ships, and back into the interior of North America. There were more battles fought with local tribes before they set up a long winter camp at Chicaza in present-day Mississippi. In the spring of 1541, the army resumed their march. In early May, they reached the bank of the widest river they had ever encountered. It was slow-moving, with no rapids, and a muddy brown color to the water. They had arrived at the mighty Mississippi River. Despite warnings from hundreds of local Indians not to proceed across this river boundary, DeSoto decided to press on. The army spent a month building boats to cross the river with their meager supplies and diminished herd of horses. The crossing was successful, and the conquistadores continued on, although now truly wandering with no specific goals or destination. The aimless expedition spent the entire summer and fall of 1541 roaming through a large area that is now Arkansas until forced to make camp for the winter. The gold they sought continued to elude them. The time had come for our DeSoto to face...